Today, we're talking about the pride of position. We're going to talk about a guy that, by the world standard, was a great man, was a good man. He's also a very sick man. Turn with me to 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings, chapter 5, and we're going to look at a guy named Naaman. And uh, uh, in all honesty, um, I struggle with pride. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you guys are all, you know, super humble and never struggle with that. But I struggle with pride. And it's interesting, in struggling with pride, you either, you either think that you're really amazing or you think that you're nothing. You know what I mean? Like if you have that struggle, or at least that's my struggle, you know. Um, that that you, you're, you're going, oh man, I'm incredible, so you have to fight that. And then, then you're like, oh no, I'm worthless, and you have to, you know, because you're not, you know, because God loves you. And so there's, there's that struggle that comes in there. And, and I don't know how, where Naaman struggled. I, I imagine he struggled initially on the side of, of thinking he was quite something. But we're going to talk about Naaman today. And, um, you know, I would, I would appreciate your prayers because uh, as, I, as I'm up here, sometimes uh, pride tries to get in while I'm up here. I, I, this is not planned in my sermon. Uh, it's, it tries to get in, and, um, and that's not okay, and I don't want that. I want to be a man of God. I want to do what he has to say. Um, at the same time, I don't want to slink away and, and not rise to the occasion that he's given me, and so I'd appreciate your prayers uh, for me today in that. Well, anyway, Naaman was successful in the world. Oh, as the world defined success. Naaman was a good man, but as I said, he was very, very ill. Let's look at 2 Kings 5.1. It says this. It says, Now Naaman captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Isn't that interesting? They're like the, the enemies of Israel and God had given victory to them. That's interesting, isn't it? The man was also a valiant war, warrior, but he was a leper. All right, He had leprosy. That's a big deal in the old days. Today, you know, we have a lot of treatments for skin disease and skin ailments, but they didn't back then. Um, and it really caused uh, a lot of hurt and damage to people. So you have this great man having this, this disease that really set him apart from people and made him so he wasn't even acceptable to his people. Really difficult. But it's interesting because Naaman, he heard the good news that there's a God in heaven that he cares for his people. Look at verse 2. It says this. It says, Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Isn't that interesting? A horrible thing, like a little child being enslaved, God used to do a great thing in someone's life. Now, it sure appears that Naaman treated his, his servant well. It sure appears that way. Um, but I just find that fascinating that, that you know, we think that, that all these negative situations we come into contact with, you know, that we, that, oh, God doesn't care about it. You know, but sometimes God uses those negative things in very amazing ways. Well, Naaman heard about it, okay, from his wife, presumably. And so he seeks God. Look in verse 4. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. I think that's like the ancient Israeli way of saying yada, yada, yada. All right? Okay. Anyway, so he says, Thus and thus. And the king of Aram said, Go now. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, there was a long, awkward pause. No, it doesn't say that. He tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. Boy, it sure looked like the king of Aram is just trying to make a way for him to attack, right? You didn't cure him? Well, you don't like us? Come on. You know, I mean, that sounds like he's starting a fight. And so the king of Israel, you know, what do you do with that? That's pretty awkward. All right. Uh, but of course, the, the king of Aram wasn't trying to do that. He, he genuinely thought the king of Israel could do something about it. Naaman is going to be sent to the man of God. He's going to be sent to Elisha. Okay. And, and we're going to talk about, because Naaman, remember, Naaman's a great man. He understands that he needs something more. Okay. He understands he can't cure leprosy. The king of Israel can't cure leprosy. He needs something more. We're going to see how pride, thinking that you're quite something, can actually hurt you. Okay? Look at this in verse 8. It says, It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? 
Now let, me, let him come to me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Now how would you expect, if you were a great man, how would you expect the man of God to treat you? How would you expect it? Good, yeah, good. What's, nicely, yeah, nicely. Say again. Lovingly, lovingly. yeah, lovingly. Kind. kind. You might expect him to treat you like you're important, right? You would, you would expect loving kindness and all that kind of stuff. But really, I mean, you're talking to a man of God, and by the way, you're a pretty great person. So you'd expect him to treat you with maybe some pomp, maybe some circumstance, maybe, maybe that he himself would come out in his nice robes and he'd talk to you and maybe do his magical thing, whatever he does. Remember, remember Naaman doesn't understand God very much yet. He just heard of him, okay? But listen to this. <clears throat> Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you'll be clean. Well, that was rather brief, okay? The servant comes out. It's obviously not the man of God. We don't know how he was dressed. You know, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if he was unkempt or not, but but obviously this is not the man of God. And just says, oh yeah, go, go wash yourself, you'll be clean. Okay? Naaman's not used to that. That is not how you treat Naaman. Okay? Because Naaman's important. And quite frankly, because of Naaman, God has given victory to Aram. You don't treat Naaman that way. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in a, he turned and went away in a rage. The Jordan can get pretty muddy. Um, you know, I've heard people say that it stinks and so on and so forth. I don't know, I wasn't there. But I know that it gets pretty dirty. I haven't been there at all. But, but it, it, it does get very dirty. Um, and these Damascus rivers, apparently he thought were much better, much cleaner, you know, more, um, more regal, maybe. maybe. Maybe for more important people. But this is the Jordan River where kind of, you know, the sons and daughters of Israel that are kind of gross, like bathe and stuff. I mean, like, you know, however he saw this, it was obviously an affront to his ego to have him go do this. You just sending me away? You didn't even talk to me. If that's where the story ended, what would Naaman's condition have been? What would it have been? He would have been a leper. And he just stayed a leper. Okay? Praise God, that's not where the story ends. But, but isn't that interesting? His pride could have stood in the way of something far greater. Now, if you don't know the story, you're already getting the gist that something crazy good happens. Okay? You, already, you can kind of get that where we're going here. But, but if that is where it stopped, if his pride had gotten in the way and he, he'd yelled at people, and he, the story would have been over. That's it. He would not have seen God's healing. Isn't that interesting? His pride could have stood in the way of what God was trying to do. His pride would have been intact. His pride would have been intact. He, he, would, have, he would have stayed, you know, Naaman, the important guy, and he would have stayed a leper. He could have chosen that, okay? See, it's interesting because God met Naaman where he was at. God is, is a relational God. He, he does not just have uh, one blanket way he deals with just everybody. Now, I'm not saying that God's word is not absolute. It is absolute, okay? But there is times that uh, God has spoken verbally to some people and not to others, and he loves them the same, okay? God deals with people where they're at. And Naaman thought he was something, okay? So isn't it interesting how God deals with him like he's nothing, all right? If you want to come to me, you're going to have to change. See that? God, God has Naaman change. God has Naaman actually humble himself away from his high position so that he can see something incredible. Neymar never, never would have conceived of this idea on his own. He thought it was going to be something special, you know, he said the hand over it, magical, you know, whatever. I mean, he didn't expect to just go take a bath. That's not very supernatural, you know. Not just take one bath, but keep dipping, you know, keep going for a while. All right, probably took a while. All right, it required Naaman to go against his pride. Naaman felt degraded by what God had called him to do and how he had called him to do it, okay? Naaman felt that he deserved better. And this is, this, as I was thinking about this sermon, uh, my father, John King, he wanted me to talk about Naaman today, and, and so the pride of position and what that means, and I was trying to think of, you know, how does that actually, you know, apply to us today, and, and what can we take from that? And I realized that there's a lot of times that I think I deserve stuff. I think I deserve to be treated in certain ways, right? 
What do we actually deserve, though? That's the question. What do we actually deserve? Does anyone know what the Scripture says we actually deserve? You know, Heather? A little? A little? It is found in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Is death. That's right. Gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? Wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. Okay? Now, we think we're pretty cool sometimes. We think we deserve other things. All right? Um, there, there's, uh, in our culture, we talk a lot about rights. And by the way, rights are very good. I am not disparaging in any way, shape, or form America, its founding, or anything. But listen to this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Listen, we should defend this idea that human beings are made in the image of God. That's amazing. It's incredible. All right? We should, we should thus show human beings dignity and respect. But sometimes, they had, but notice what the Founding Fathers did. They defended the rights of their people, okay? Yes, they, they got rights out of it too, okay? But they were defending the rights of mankind there in, in, in our nation, all right? The idea, I, the idea can get into our heads that we deserve things that we want and that we deserve to be treated in certain ways. See, it's one thing for me to defend your rights. One thing for me to defend the image of God in use. Another thing for me to try to seize things that I think should be mine. Does that make sense? There's one that is selfless and one that is selfish, okay? <clears throat> uh, the idea gets in our head we deserve things we want or we deserve to be treated in certain ways. So the idea that once served to glorify God by, the defend, by defending the value of the people he made in his image here in America can be twisted to become a defense of shallow, selfish actions instead. And I think we've all seen it. I think we've seen people that are like, you, I deserve this, I deserve that, you know. That's not right. That's not right. But we think we deserve. And in all honesty, if I was to, to look at myself, I could say, well, I'm not like that. Yes, I am. I have been like that. I pray to God that I, that I repented and that maybe that's not in me anymore. You know, but I might find a spot in me that still is. And I'll have to repent of that too. But I don't want to be that person that, is, that thinks I deserve something that I don't. Okay, because I deserve death. But God gave me grace instead through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Okay. In our culture, though, in general, we do talk a lot about what we deserve. And I think it gets in our brains. There's a lot of commercial campaigns. Uh, L'Oreal... Uh, had a commercial campaign once that says, because I'm worth it. <laughs> You're worth it. You deserve it. Right? <laughs> McDonald's. This is kind of old, but they used to say, you deserve a break today. Really? Do you really deserve a break today? You might take a break. You might need a break. But you don't deserve a break. You, you deserve death. All right? Well, I deserve a break. I deserve it. All right? So I should go get it. Burger King. Remember, have it your way. All right? And then they get the order wrong. No, I'm kidding. Me. All right. <laughs> But unfortunately, our church culture can kind of reflect that tendency. You know, what if I'm hurt by someone in the church or outside the church? All right? I might think that I have a right to hold a grudge. I have a right to, you don't understand what this person did to me. Right? We, we think we have a right to hold a grudge. Do we have that right? Do we deserve? No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay? What if we don't want to serve others that are in need? You know, I, I'm, I'm passing people by that are in genuine need, and I don't want to serve them. Right? Do I have a right to refuse to help? No. I don't have that right. I don't have that right. What if someone seems dirty or uncomfortable for me to be around? There's genuinely hard people to be around, unlovable people to be around, for whatever reason. Right? Does that give me a right to look down on them or to avoid them? No. No. What do we actually deserve? We deserve death. And since we don't have it, how will we not act like that anymore? If we have Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he's taken that away. He's taken the penalty of what I deserved. Out of gratitude, could I not serve him and serve the people around me? That's the attitude you want. That's the attitude of a believer. David Platt is the guy that wrote this book called Radical. And uh, he, says, uh, he says in it, he says, We are settling for a Christianity it revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. Isn't that interesting? I think we can get caught in that trap where it's just like, oh man, I, you know, this makes me feel good, or this makes me, feel, even in church, you know, I can, I can listen to, to certain music or maybe a certain pastor or whatever, ah, oh, you know, that person makes me feel good. And, and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, 
But if that's the, if that's the only reason I'm doing it, right, that's, that's about self. That's not about, oh, this glorifies God. Does that make sense? Like, like it's, it's, it's not bad to get something cool out of church. Okay, that's not the, the idea. We don't have to sit here and do the, uh, the Puritan eight-hour-long sermon, though we can start today. No, we won't do that. No, we... <laughs> We can start that. We don't, we don't have to do that, but, but at the same time, at the same time, shouldn't what I go after glorify God, right? I don't deserve to have a church body that caters to my every whim. I deserve death. I am grateful to have a church body that edifies me, right? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. David Platt says, he, he goes on in, in, uh, in Radical, he says, we desperately need to explore how much of our understanding of the gospel is American and how much is biblical. You know, there can be this idea that I, I deserve a good life. There can be this idea that I deserve um, amazing amounts of riches or whatever, and if I would just, you know, do this one thing that God is waiting for me to do, I'll have great riches and stuff. And it doesn't mean that God can't bless. He can. He can, absolutely. Okay, and he does. Materially, He does. Okay, but if I am seeking that ahead of glory to God, there's a problem. There's a problem. That should be used for, I don't deserve it. If I'm blessed with it, that's fine, but I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to keep my money. God has blessed my, my, my wife and I. We've been blessed materially amazingly, you know? We don't deserve any of it. We don't deserve to keep it. And if God should choose to take it, I won't lie, it will be hard, but that's okay, because he's God, and he's allowed to do that. I don't deserve it. Swallowed pride. How does pride, how's pride working out for us? Like when we are prideful, how's it working out for us? You know, if I decide I I don't want to defend, or I don't want to forgive that person that hurts me, how's that working out for me? Am I feeling better? No. No, I'm in mean, much of a prison as that other person is. They can't get forgiven, and I can't forgive it. Come on. That's a prison, right? It doesn't work out for us. How is it going to work out for Naaman? Stay a leper. Okay. That doesn't, that doesn't help, right? Pride doesn't work out for us very well, okay? It keeps us sitting in that selfish state that never lets us see God's power. You're never satisfied if you're always focused on deserving something more than what you have. Remember um, uh, Rockefeller? He said, they said, how much money is enough? He said, oh, just a little bit more, right? And he kept going for more and more money. He was never satisfied his whole life. He had this drive. A lot of people in Hollywood, um, I heard an interview or read an interview on uh, Madonna one time, and, and she, that lady is just driven, driven. If she starts thinking that people aren't thinking about her, she, she, she goes fanatic. I mean, you've seen her behavior. <laughs> There's reasons why. Like she just is like, I've got to get in the limelight again. I've got to be that person again. I mean, she's driven for that. What a sad existence. God loves Madonna. She needs Jesus. That is a sad existence. I mean, she can't ever be satisfied. She can't ever be content. That is sad. There's no contentment, no joy. Focusing on what we ought to have instead of being thankful for what we do have. Here's where things can turn around. Humble obedience is what God requires. And humble obedience allows you to see God's work. When you're humble and you meet and you you join God in what he's doing, get ready for something amazing. Look at verse 13. It says this, Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide there real quick here. There's a picture Oh, that's not that. No, I'm sorry. We'll get to that later. That's okay. All right, we clean. Uh, so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. That wasn't comfortable. David Platt goes on. By the way, David Platt is not the Bible, but he has some good quotes, so I'm giving it to you. He says this, I could not help but think that somewhere along the way we missed what was radical about our faith and replaced it with what is comfortable. What is comfortable? That's not what God calls us to. He doesn't call us to comfort. He calls us to obedience. Naaman swallowed his pride and embraced humility. He did the thing that he thought himself too high and mighty to be bothered with. He did something that was uncomfortable for him. And God honored his obedience with healing. What would happen if we didn't think ourselves too important or too deserving to do the things God calls us to do? 
Maybe, maybe we're even afraid to do those things. You know, fearing we'll lose something in the process, lose like control, the right to do it as we wish, or, or the object of our selfish desire. I've had those fears, right? But wouldn't it be nice if God shows us how amazing things could be if we obeyed him to make our choice easier? Wouldn't it be nice if God is like, listen, if you obey me, here's what I'll do. That would be nice, right? Because then we'd see all the blessing, right? We'd see all the blessing. I find that interesting because God doesn't typically do that. I'm not saying he never does. God is God, and he can do what he wants, okay? He can give us, he can tell us what's going to happen beforehand. That's fine, all right? But isn't it interesting? If he was to do that, would I maybe do it out of selfish motives? You know? If God told me all the blessings I was going to receive, it's like, oh, yeah, that's way better. I'll just go ahead and do that, okay? That's like, that's selfishness again, right? Now, we do know God blesses, but isn't it interesting that when he doesn't do that, Sometimes he meets us and shows us the blessing after we've obeyed. In fact, most of the time, that's the way it works, right? He shows it afterwards. There's a story. Go to the next slide now. Here we go. This is not Naaman. This is Corey Ten Boom. And uh, I don't know how you get a name like Ten Boom. I, I mean, maybe you're a very explosive personality or something. But, but uh, anyway, Corey Ten Boom, she writes a story. Um, uh, she, was, she was in the concentration camps in Germany. Um, what had happened is, is she and, oh, was it in Germany? Uh, I think it was Holland, Holland. Um, anyway, she, she, when, when the Nazis had taken over, she and her sister and her family, they had tried to make um, a hiding place. There's, in fact, there's a book called The Hiding Place. There's a movie called The Hiding Place. It's about this time they made this hiding place for Jews. They knew what was going on was wrong, was sick, was messed up. They knew something was wrong, so they tried to do something about it. Okay? And for a while, they were successful, and then they got caught. All right. And at that point, in Nazi Germany, if you went against the powers that be, well, you went to the camps too. Okay? So she and her, and her family uh, went to the camps. And I'm not sure how many of them survived, but she did survive. And it's pretty miraculous. Check that story out sometime. Uh, it's very worth uh, looking at. But later on, Corrie ten Boom went on to speak and to talk to people. And I'm going to read a story that comes out of that. And I want you to see what happens when Corrie ten Boom obeys. Okay? It was in a church in Munich that I saw him a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, the, the war ended 1945, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with a message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that it's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence. In silence, collected their wraps. In silence, they left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, rib sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück, concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. Forgive me, I'm going to try an accent here. A fine, a fine message, Freilein. How good it is to know that, as you say, our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Raymond's Brook in your talk, he was saying. I was a god there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins and had again and again been forgiven, and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place, 
Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I know it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had, come home, had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started up in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. As I did then. Philippians 2, 3-8, it says this, says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You might wonder sometimes. You might wonder, you say, you know, where is God? I mean, can he help me to, to do the things that, that are hard that I don't, that I don't want to do? And uh, sometimes you might even start wondering about where he is, who he is, and, and, and if he's even there. My friend, um, Jake Culver, said something very awesome. And uh, he says, are you having doubts about God and who he is? He said, try obedience for a while. See what happens. Isn't that interesting? Is that God often meets us on the other side of obedience. God meets us there. Pride is not an easy thing to get rid of. Okay? I don't think it was easy for Naaman to do that. He was not accustomed to that. All right? But God can meet us there. Forgiveness and putting oneself in a place where I forgive someone who's hurt me as badly as Corey ten Boom had been hurt would not be easy. But God meets us on the other side of obedience. Naaman's heart and his life were changed towards his creator. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. But, he said, but Elisha said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And Naaman urged him to take it, but Elisha refused. Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. He's going to take the dirt from Israel and go make an altar. It sounds like he's going to make an altar over there to sacrifice to God on. He's like, I'm not even, I'm, I'm here, man. This is, this, I'm, I'm with you guys. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leads on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. That was a foreign god. You can go to the next one. There's a picture of him I found. You see that? There he is. Yeah, it's just an it's ancient Aramean God. It's a false God. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. So Elisha said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him some distance. God changed Corrie ten Boom and Naaman after they had humbled themselves and obeyed. Listen, we would like to have wisdom, unity, community, healing, and be rewarded by God, right? I mean, those are things we would like to have. Like, we'd like to see those in our lives, Right? But if you look at the scriptures, you find some interesting things. These blessings all come by putting God in his proper place and putting our own fleshly selves and our fleshly desires aside. Isn't that interesting? See, it's not about us. It's about him, right? The key to wisdom is God's words, not men's. If you want wisdom, you go to God for that, all right? The key to unity is to submitting to one another in Christ, okay? The key to community is serving the needs of others. The key to healing is humility, the reward, God rewards those who seek him first above themselves and their own pride. That's a constant theme in scriptures is not me, 
You, not me, you. It's constant in scriptures. That's how you defeat pride. Okay? You put God in his proper place. In Hebrews eleven six 6 says, that Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he, comes, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder of those who seek him. God does reward those who seek him. Okay? You've got to humble yourself and approach him that way. Not, God, I deserve this. No, you don't. No. But he does want to bless you. There is a story that goes right after this. It's about Gehazi. I won't go into it because I don't, I don't think it's uh, necessary to do so. But Gehazi was the, the helper of Elisha. And Gehazi had kind of the opposite idea. You know, he saw that money that Naaman had. And he's like, man, I want some of that. I, you know, he was more interested in the things of this world. I mean, this amazing thing had just happened, right? This commander of Aram had just been healed. And Gehazi was more interested in getting, getting money. Do you think if God can heal someone of leprosy, he can get you what you need monetarily? Yeah. Yeah, Gehazi, though, he wasn't thinking about just the things he needed. He, he's, he's thinking, oh, man, I could do this, I could do that. You know, he was thinking about himself. There's pride in that, isn't there? Isn't there greed in that? So Gehazi goes after him, and uh, he, he runs after him. And Naaman is on the chariot and looks back and sees this guy coming. Oh, man, something's wrong. So he gets off. He says, oh, hey, what, is anything wrong? Gehazi says, oh, oh, my master has some friends come in, and he wants you to give him some gifts. Okay? All right, you know, pride just brings more sin. He's lying, Right? He says, you want some more gifts? So Naaman says, oh, all right, all right, yeah, 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 here, take this. And he says, take some more, take some more. You know, he, he gives him some more stuff. He gives him two talents of silver, all right, and some clothes and stuff. Gehazi goes back, and, and the servants go with him, and it says when he comes to the hill, there must have been a hill right behind the house there. When he comes to the hill, Gehazi takes the stuff from the servants and sends them off. That doesn't look suspicious at all, does it? You know, I'll let you carry it until we get close to the house, then you better just go ahead and leave. Anyway, Gehazi takes him into the house, and he hides it. And Elisha has him come stand before him. He says, where have you been, Gehazi? says, your servant went nowhere. And Elisha says, was my heart not with you when you saw the man in the chariot when you took the silver from him? He says, therefore his leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. And Gehazi left leprous, white as snow. Pride brings death. It says in James 1.15, it says, then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Let's not think about what we deserve. Let's think about the amazing gifts God has given us and act accordingly. Be like Naaman. Don't be like a Hazai. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and for all you've given us in Christ. I pray that you help us to become more like you in every way, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to put those, those things aside that we think we deserve, Lord, and instead uh, take up humility, Lord, and that we would uh, seek you and, and seek to obey you and do what you'd have us do. Thank you so much for all you've given us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If God has spoken to your heart and you'd like to choose him as your Lord and Savior today, we invite you to come.